Caribbean state of Trinidad and Tobago has long been famous for its spectacular carnival. But in 2017, we reported on a more sinister reputation it was then developing, as the nation with the highest recruitment rate to ISIL in the Western Hemisphere. So what happened to the young Trinidadians who went to join Islamic State? For this updated episode, Juliana Rufus has been finding out. I just made Gosul in the Euphrates in minus one degrees. Shane Crawford has just washed to prepare for prayer in Syria. The year is 2013, and Crawford is believed to be the first Islamic State recruit from the Caribbean island of Trinidad and Tobago. All right, everybody put one bullet in the chamber. Bismillah. And this is Crawford's best friend, Farid Mustafa seen here training snipers in a recruitment video made by Islamic State or ISIL. According to government estimates, 130 Trinidadians, including women and children, have since joined Crawford and Mustafa in the Middle East. This makes Trinidad the highest per capita contributor to ISIL in the Western Hemisphere. And some experts think up to 400 people may have gone. I cannot sit and watch my children grow up in this land which they cannot practice their Islam 100%. Now we are in the Islamic State, there is everything we need. But these happy images of schools that ISIL said they ran were only one side of the story. Other Trinidadians joined as fighters and many were killed in battle. It is this edition of the ISIL magazine Dabiq that really made international headlines. In an appeal to Muslims in his home country, Shane Crawford called on them to take the fight back to Trinidad and to terrify the disbelievers in their own homes and to make the streets run with their blood. The question is, why do so many Trinidadians take up arms for ISIL in the first place? Trinidad is best known for its world-famous carnival and may seem an odd place to be exporting fighters to ISIL. But there is a long-established Muslim community of both African and Indian descent. They make up only 6% of the population, but over the last decades, the voice of black Muslims has become louder, mainly because of this man. The life of every Muslim has a sacred trust. Imam Yassin Abu Bakr leads a movement called the Jamaat al muslimin the community of Muslims. It was founded in the 1980s to empower Afro-Trinidadians who were converting to Islam. In the early days, the Jamaat al muslimin came to public notice because on the streets its enforcers were tackling the country's growing drugs trade. Their militant image was new to Muslims here. Do you always have private security with you? I have no private security. These are just my people who are here with me all the time. No, I go anywhere, anyhow, I run this town here. I think that what I have is more powerful than a gun. I have a heart that has full of love for people, and that's my protection. But Abu Bakr led the only armed Islamic uprising against the Western government. On 27th of July, 1990, he and his men stormed parliament and held its MPs at gunpoint. At 6 p.m. this afternoon, the government of Trinidad and Tobago was overthrown. The prime minister and members of the cabinet are under arrest. The Jamaat al muslimin wanted to topple a government they said was criminal and corrupt, but the population failed to support them. After six days of chaos in which 24 people lost their lives, Abu Bakr accepted an offer of amnesty and surrendered. He claims when the Jamaat al muslimin stopped policing the streets after the coup, the government lost control and the power of the drug gangs erupted into a spiral of violence. 
pre-1990, anybody could tell you Trinidad was under control. Um, the murder rate would not reach 100. The murder rate now is 450. They, they go to almost 500. And this is predominantly among the African people, the same old slave population that nobody ever did anything to help, you know. Abu Bakr says the root cause that has been left untreated remains poverty. The Jamaat runs food and school programs for the community. The, the Africans are going to go in a pool of unemployment, nothing. They just sit in the ghetto and do nothing, and then the drugs come in, you know, and it's a haven for the drugs, and, and, and now the guns are in, so the murder rates is just spiraling out of control. Do you think there is a connection between that and the fact that members of the Afro-Trinidadian community have gone to fight in Syria? It's because of the marginalization and, and the difficulties with them to succeed because they're African Muslims. Little is known about how fighters in Trinidad are actually recruited. And to find out more, we have set off to follow the stories of Shane Crawford and Farid Mustafa. With carnival taking over the streets, some Muslims opt for family-friendly retreats. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Like this one, set up in a car park. Are we ready for a camp? No, 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 no. Here, a man who knew both Crawford and Mustafa has agreed to meet us. Businessman Ashmid Mohammed has brought his whole family along. He instantly recognizes Crawford's photo. I know this brother. He was in jail with me. Me and this brother here, Farid, we was in the same cell. They had three, three of us in a cell. So then you know them intimately. I mean, can, can you describe I, them more? What sort of yeah, characters they were? They have good character, good character. In 2011, Ashmeet, Crawford, Mustafa and others were arrested for conspiring to assassinate the Prime Minister. But all were soon released due to lack of evidence. Some people believe that the government of the time used the alleged plot as a pretext to arrest people who were being tracked for other reasons. Why do you think your name appeared on this list of people yeah, accused that, that is, of wanting to kill the Prime yeah, Minister? That is a million dollar question. It's because every so often I would go to visit um, a place in Rio Claro called Booz Settlement, and there's a Jamaat over there led by Imam Nazim. And that Jamaat has been labeled as, uh, you know, on the watchdog list. Quite a few of the people who went to Syria are known to have been part of the Jamaat or community of Booz Mosque in the town of Rio Claro. Farid Mustafa lived there for a while, Others, like Shane Crawford, just passed through. I see new people just appearing in our Jamaat. People I know doesn't belong to Rio Claro. They would come there, they would stay there for about a week or two, and then they disappear. And the people in, in the Jamaat themselves don't even know they are leaving. Because if you go into Syria to fight war with ISIS, of course you would want to go silent. You wouldn't want to tell your shadow because you don't want to be caught. Ashmeet says someone tried to recruit him too. I remember clearly one night a brother telling me that he is considering going to Syria and I should also go. He said, go courageously into jihad and die with some bullets on your chest, on your head in the cause of Allah. If you die in that position, it's the most honorable death you can get, according to Islamic teachings. This is why you see so many people just rushing to Syria, you know, not investigating carefully who are these groups. I say, no, I don't think I need to go to Syria to go to heaven. Yet others came very close to leaving. Farid Mustafa's former housemate at Booz Mosque has publicly stated that he considered joining ISIL. Umar Abdullah, okay, nice to meet you. Umar Abdullah says he was part of the 1990 coup, but felt let down by its leaders. We felt that Abu Bakr should not have um, surrendered. We were prepared to go down and fight. We were prepared to establish an Islamic government here in this country and establish an Islamic state. Abdullah claims he planned terrorist attacks within Trinidad, but none have come to fruition. Now he wants to pursue an Islamic state 
by peaceful means. He's agreed to take us to Boo's mosque in Rio Claro. This may be rural Trinidad, but carnival is in full swing. Carnival now has changed a lot since you were young. Yeah, a whole lot. It has gotten more vulgar, it has gotten more violent, more immoral. Boo's mosque lies just outside town. Its Imam Nazim Mohammed very rarely talks to the media. But thanks to Umar Abdullah, he has agreed to speak to us. Hello, Juliana, nice to meet you. The Imam and his family have given out land for free to create a self-sufficient community based on Islamic principles. This is Jamaat's land, and we cut it into lots and give brothers to build houses. So they are, this is their own houses. And altogether, how big is your Jamaat, your group? About 25 homes or so. 25 homes? Homes, yeah. That's quite substantial. Yeah. Umar Abdullah and Farid Mustafa used to live in one of these houses until Mustafa fell out with the Imam. Because you asked him to leave the mosque? Yeah. Why was that? He, he was disobedient and so on and so forth. And part of it is that you have to obey. One of the things that has been reported is that it involved the matter of a killing, that he was unhappy. Him and Shane Crawford um, were, were not happy with, with something that happened in the community. Yeah, but I don't want to go into detail on these things, okay. right now, I mean, because it won't be fair to him and fair to me. There are reports that Crawford and Mustafa carried out a double murder before traveling to Syria. This mosque has long been on the radar of intelligence agencies like the FBI, who came to question Imam Nazim. I'm not a campaigner for ISIS and so on and so forth. But I, on truth, and what I am concerned about, American policies and these super, so-called superpower policies. Sister, the world will be better off with all these people. If somebody came to you, uh, a young Trinidadian, and said, I'm, I'm not sure if I should go and, and, and go to the Caliphate and join ISIL and fight, would you encourage them or would you try and hold them back? Mm -hmm. My daughter went there, gone there. I never knew that. I never knew that. Until a week after, she ran at a mission so on so please. You may not believe that. I never knew that. Why do you think she left? I don't know. Mm -hmm. If I'm encouraging, then would not my daughter is in, tell me, look, look, we go in so and so place. I never, my next daughter gone. I never knew that. By now, at least 13 members of Nazim Mohammed's family have set off for Syria. Children, their spouses, and grandchildren. After leaving the mosque, Umar Abdullah takes us to the house he shared with Farid Mustafa when they first came to Rio Claro. We pretty much enjoyed each other's company. Did you speak to him after he left to Syria? Were you in touch with him when he was there? We did share uh, some words by one of the social networks. What did he say? He was uh, encouraging me to come. And um, what, was, uh, what was Farid like? That's, that's, that's exactly who Farid was. What you're seeing there, Always I would make a joke every now and again, would laugh, we would, you know, things like that. So, so this killing that Shane and, and Farid carried out, what light does that throw on him? Because that's not the happy-go-lucky person that we see in the pictures. No, that's not the person I used to live with. What I can see is that Farid had developed a type of um, eagerness to fight for justice, truth and justice, to seek out. Uh, ways and means and how he can, um, you know, uh, defend his brothers and sisters. By 2013, Mustafa and Crawford had already planned their trip to join ISIL, but delayed it to avenge the death of a brother from Boo's mosque. He had been shot while trying to buy a gun. While driving around the city of Chaguanas, they found their targets. And this is the corner where Farid Mustafa and Shane Crawford carried out their killing. It's a spot well known for trouble. They jumped out of their car in broad daylight and shot dead their two victims. Within weeks, both were in Syria. The fear is that ISIL recruitment has been feeding off Trinidad's gang wars. Some of the feuding gangs drawn their Muslim identity and are closely associated with mosques. We head to Enterprise on the outskirts of Chaguanas, 
where Shane Crawford grew up. Violence surged in Enterprise in July 2016 after the murder of Selwyn Alexis, also known as Robocop. Two others died at the scene, including the killer. Alexis was never convicted of any crimes, but he was widely believed to be the godfather of a local Muslim gang. After his killing, some former associates set up their own gang. They became known as unruly ISIS. It is Friday and unruly ISIS have agreed for us to join them for prayers. The group is accused of a series of killings, but the sermon is one of peace. We want the people to feel safe around the Muslims. We want the people to love the Muslims. This is what Islam is about. Standing in as Imam in this makeshift mosque is Avinash Sipasand, aka Abdul Wakil, and generally known as Crisis. The Russian we like we is criminals. The Russian we like we is terrorists. The call and we all kind of names, my brothers. We asked Crisis about the murder of Robocop Alexis. My friend killed him. I'm being real with you. My friend killed him and he died. Not the reason why he killed him. People might say, oh, here what, the, here what the, 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 the news would say about this guy, right? They would say he was a, um, a well-known businessman. That's what the news said about him. You know what I'm saying? But we over here in Enterprise, we know that he was a kidnapper. He killed many people. You know what I'm saying? Pryce says he wants his crew to be known simply as Muslims, claiming the name Unruly ISIS was given to them by the media. He thinks anyone going to join ISIL is misguided, saying it's wrong for Muslims to kill Muslims. So how then does he justify the same thing in enterprise? You gotta understand something. People call it as killing, but mm -hmm. in reality, we watch it as we defending ourselves. So it's like, you know somebody coming to kill you, so it's like, bam, you go get him first. You know what I'm saying? That's what's going on. And, and that's this. okay with Allah? No, it's not okay. It's okay to defend yourself. You know what I'm saying? But it's not okay to kill an innocent person. It's never okay to kill an innocent person. It's not that we going to come out one day and say, well, okay, give me that gun. I'm going to kill this guy. No, it's not that. That's what they make it seem like it is. It's our back against the walls. It's got, it got everything to do with these people who bring in the drugs into our country. If they would stop the drugs and the guns, I swear we'll have no killing, no crime in Trinidad. The perception is that ISIL recruited gang members who were already used to violence by promising them a more meaningful life. But many Trinidadian recruits are well educated and come from wealthy families whose lawyers advise them not to talk. So we return to the mosque of Jamaat al Muslimin to meet a man who personally knew more than 15 of them, Fuad Abu Bakr, the son of the 1990s coup leader. Politicians sometimes try to minimalize the issue and say that, you know, it's a small group of people who are you know, criminally oriented who get involved in these things. And that is not true. People travel and put themselves at risk for ideological reasons. And then they try to recruit others. If I have a friend who's um, already traveled to Syria and they're sending me pictures of, you know, schools with kids and, and, and gardens and a society that is operating by Islamic law, that would interest a Muslim individual. But videos attributed to ISIL that depict violence are often dismissed as American propaganda. When a Muslim sees these videos of decapitating people on the beach and, and, and music playing in the background and these gory things, I don't think many of them trust those images. You know, many people say, well, who verified that footage? The roots of the problem are in Trinidad, he says. I think some people feel as though there is no hope almost in changing the political system that exists here. And I strongly believe that some of these individuals say maybe we would make more of a difference um, there. The government's response has been to pass a new anti-terror bill aimed at curbing recruitment. 
A former national security minister explains what's happening. The organizations are well known by the agents, by the law enforcement agencies and the state. And what is required is to continue not just to monitor them, but to red flag them and to find avenues to suppress them. If you don't provide the deterrent, if you do not ex explain and let these people know that you are enemies of the state and I'm going to crush you, I'm not going to negotiate with you, you embolden them. You make them feel that they have an opportunity now to speak more in camera, to try to lure more individuals. And that is what should be prevented. What Trinidad fears most is an attack on home soil, especially on its lucrative oil and gas industry. If it is that you are going on that road, we need to crush you. We need to prevent you from going. And if it is you do go, we need to put everything possible to make sure you do not ever get back. So the deterrent will be there for all others to understand. We're going to keep you back there in hell and you're going to be killed or you're going to die in Syria. And that is what is required. Indeed. Many Trinidadians who travel to Syria are no longer alive. Farid Mustafa died in battle and Shane Crawford was killed by an American drone. And then in June 2017, Kurdish forces and the US coalition attacked ISIL's de facto capital, Raqqa. Most men stay to fight, but their women and an estimated 1,200 ISIL children fled towards safety. Among them, these two boys. Hi, mommy. I love you. I want to come back to you. I miss you. Hi, mommy. I love you. I miss you. I want to come back. It's a WhatsApp message sent by the Red Cross from northern Syria in 2018. Mahmoud and Ayub had been there for four years, abducted by their Trinidadian father from their mother, Felicia Perkins Ferreira. Since then, the boys have been reunited with Felicia. And so, two years after our first filming trip to Trinidad, we've returned to meet them. When he left, he told me he was going by his mother. So, and I was going to work. So I, I couldn't even say I could have put one and one together to say like they were going or leaving the country. Felicia's husband is believed to have died and the boys ended up here. The Roj camp for ISIL members run by Kurdish forces. When Felicia traveled 10,000 kilometers to be reunited with them, it made national news. Two children from Trinidad and Tobago who were kidnapped and taken to Syria to fight with ISIS are tonight back with their mother in Syria. When I saw them, Ayub, he was like, Mommy, I'm ready to go. He didn't hold back. Mahmoud hold back the tears because he always tried to play bigger. But as soon as we closed the door where the cameras were not there, he literally broke down. To just have them in my arms once again, it was like, I can't, I can't explain. Once home, Mahmoud and Ayub received psychological support organized by Trinidad's Ministry of Security, which is also investigating the circumstances of other women and children still held in ISIL refugee camps. They include families from Felicia's religious community and her best childhood friend. She's over there still with her, her three kids. She had two here and one over in Syria. Her friend had told her that living under ISIL was not as they'd once imagined it. They're tired, frustrated, devastated, depressed. I mean, I could go on and on, but basically all they want is to come back home, just go back into reality life and how it used to be. Felicia is now campaigning for their return. She's under the watch of the authorities and a policeman was present during our interview. I still have, you know, families out there in Stan because the majority of them, I grew up with them. So to know that I still have mothers crying, you know, for their kids, it, it really mashes me up. Nearly 100 Trinidadian women and children are known to have emerged from ISIL territory. The Trinidadian government is now working on legislation that will determine whether and how they can return. There are fears that not everyone who has fled has given up on violent means. But back at home, the issues that caused so many Trinidadians to leave their country are yet to be addressed. 